good to have everybody here this morning. Today we're kind of doing a wrap up on our series, What's in Your Hand? And the whole theme of this series has been talking about who we are, how we are, the way God created us, and how do we surrender that to Him and be the people He wants us to be. And today we're going to be talking about God's plan, because I believe that God has a plan. Dave Ramsey talked about how does God's plan affect our finances and how we use that and how we control what God has entrusted us with to be reflective of Him in our life. And today I want to talk about how do we take who we are, the way we are, the way we function, the way we interact with the world that God has called us to live in, how do we do that in a way according to God's plan? One of the things that we're going to be looking at is a couple of scriptures. The first one we're going to look at is from Numbers chapter 32. And in Numbers chapter 32, the Israelites are getting ready to go into the promised land. And there's a group of Israelites, the Gadites and the Reubenites, that decide that they would rather stay on the east side of the Jordan instead of going into the promised land. And so as they are preparing to go into the promised land, they go to Moses and they say, Moses, we want to stay over here on the east side. And Moses is like, are you kidding me? We sent people in to spy out the land, and because of their sinfulness of not following God's call, we had to wander around in the wilderness to die off a whole generation. And now you want to stay over here? And they say, no, really, we want to go and stay here. There's a great place for our herds and our flocks. There's great places to build houses for our families. But we will cross the Jordan River and help take care of the giants and all those strongholds that are in the promised land, and then we'll come back and we'll enjoy this inheritance. And so that's what we're going to be reading about in Numbers chapter 32. And then we're going to talk about Numbers 32. Then we're also going to be looking at Mark chapter 12, when Jesus is talked about what the greatest command is and how we live out life. And so join with me, if you will, to uh, Numbers chapter 32, starting with verse 6. Moses said to the Gadites and the Reubenites, Shall your countrymen go to war while you sit here? Why do you discourage the Israelites from going over into the land the Lord has given them? This is what your fathers did when I sent them from Kadesh Barnea to look over the land. After they went up to the valley of Eshcol and viewed the land, they, were, they discouraged the Israelites from entering the land the Lord had given them. The Lord's anger was aroused that day, and he swore on his oath, because they have not followed me wholeheartedly. Not one of the men, 20 years old or more, who came, out of, out of, came up out of Egypt will see the land I promised on oath to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not one except Caleb, son of Jephnia, the Kenzanite, and Joshua, son of Nun, for they followed the Lord wholeheartedly. The Lord's anger burned against Israel, and he made them wander in the desert 40 years until the whole generation of those who had once done evil in his sight were gone. And here you are, a brood of sinners." standing in the place of your fathers, making the Lord even more angry with Israel. If you turn away from following him, he will again leave all this people in the desert, and you will be the cause of their destruction. They came up to him and said, We would like to build pens here for our livestock and cities for our women and children, but we are ready to arm ourselves and go ahead of the Israelites until we have brought them to their place. Meanwhile, our women and children will live in fortified cities for protection from the inhabitants of the land, and we will not return to our homes until every Israelite has received their inheritance. We will not receive any inheritance with them on the other side of the Jordan because our inheritance has come to us on the east side of the Jordan. And in Mark chapter 12, Jesus is meeting with some Pharisees, and some Pharisees are trying to trap Jesus, and they're, they're trying to get Jesus all messed up in his thought, and they're trying to get him to say the wrong things. And so they come to Jesus, and they say, okay, Jesus, we know as a people, as a Jewish people, we've read the scriptures, we've studied the scriptures, and the Ten Commandments are the key to the way you've called us to live our life. So you tell us, Jesus, which is the greatest command? And they, their thoughts are, Jesus is going to name one of these Ten Commandments, and then they're going to trap him because they're going to say, oh, so... We don't have to follow the other nine. That's what they're wanting to do. They're trying to trap Jesus. Jesus understands that. And so he says this to them in Mark chapter 12, starting with verse 29. He says this. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, to love your neighbor as yourself. 
And so what Jesus does in that little edict to the Pharisees, he tells them the summary of all the Ten Commandments. The first part of the Ten Commandments describes our relationship to God. The second part of the Ten Commandments describes our relationship to those around us, our neighbors. And he says, the greatest command is to be 100% sold out to God. And the second is like the first to be doing the same to your neighbor, to be loving and caring and compassionate in your interaction with our neighbor. So what is God's plan for our life? Well, a couple of things I want us to learn from these passages today that I believe when we recognize who we are, the way God has made us, the way God has called us to live our life, and when we follow his plan, his principle, it makes a difference in our life and it makes a, a difference in the lives of those around us. And the first thing is this. We know that there will always be walls or strongholds that we have to deal with. In every part of our life, we're going to be dealing with strongholds. And today we have a wall here to represent that. This wall is 10 feet, 2 inches tall. Now, we got a couple of athletic young men over here. Do any one of you guys think you can come and cross this wall by yourself? You can't use any of the sides. Just go straight up the wall right here. Can you do it? No? Dylan, you're a basketball player. You're like six foot something. You sure you can't just do that? Does anybody here think they can? The reality is, to cross these walls, it's difficult. And so, I have this wall established here today, and we're going to be writing some stuff on this wall that describes to us the walls that we have to cross in our life and the strongholds that are a part of our life that we have to Succumb. We have to get over top of. And we're going to see as we move through the sermon this morning that, that God has a plan that, that includes more than just me. And last week I'd ask you to send an email or a text about what those various things are that are walls or that are strongholds in our life. And so I'm just going to be giving a various list of these things. These are some of them are things that people have told me, have emailed me, have texted me. Some of them are things that I'm aware of from interacting with people. Uh, and there's going to be more than I'm going to get on this list. And I've asked Viola to write because if I did the writing, I'm certain you wouldn't read it. And so um, I want you to be able to read it. So what are some of those things? Well, some of those pieces that we deal with are those challenges we face in relationships. Relationships can be really hard. We, we have people sitting here today that my guess is, is you have, there's some people within the sound of my voice based on statistics that you're struggling in your relationships. It may be relationships with your children. It may be relationships with your parents. It may be relationships with your spouse. It can be a relationship that's at work. It can be relationships with anybody, and they're really challenging. We have people that are here today that you are dealing with the strongholds or the struggles with drugs. Um, drugs consume so many people, and drugs are not just the big ones of, of crack and cocaine and heroin and marijuana, but we can be addicted to prescription drugs, and we see that all the time. There are people that are dealing here today that are struggling with addictions to alcohol, and it consumes you, and it tears you up. We have people that are dealing with addictions and strongholds of pornography, and pornography is the number one wrecker of marriages and family today in our culture, and it's the fastest growing. It's the largest dollar figure in America today, the, the money that is spent on pornography is greater than the budgets of the NBA, the Major League Baseball, and the NFL combined, according to statistics. We have people that are here today that are dealing with the strongholds or the struggles of discontentment or contentment, however you want to word it. We're not content with what we have. We want to have more and we're never satisfied. We have people that are here today and a stronghold for you is your family. You, you, you want to expand and do things, but yet your family takes precedence over everything. And, and God tells us in his word that our family is important, but he always, always, always wants to be number one in our life. We have people here today that are struggling with a stronghold of busyness. We just get our ourselves so busy that we're not able to do the important things. One of the, one of the best advice that was given to me when I started in ministry was from a dear friend of mine, Eldon King. And Eldon said to me, he said, Glenn, whatever you do, structure your life 
so that when people come to you, whenever it is, you have opportunities and not interruptions. And I realize in my own life and in many lives, our lives are so structured and so scheduled that we have all these interruptions instead of opportunities. We have people that are here today that are dealing with jealousy. We're jealous about the way someone looks or the way that someone is able to do work or the business that they have or the house that they live in or the family that they have or the things that we want to have different that's like theirs. And so we have these walls that we're trying to circum, to go over top of that are dealing with jealousy. We have ourselves to deal with. Adam and Eve in the garden, they had everything given to them. God prayed all the animals past them, gave them this beautiful, luscious place. He said, this is for your enjoyment. This is for you to live with and care for and to love and have as your own. And then God said, but there's one thing about the garden. You cannot eat of the tree of knowledge of good and evil that's in the center of the garden. And what did they do? They went to the tree and they wanted it. They weren't content. They dealt with a lot of these pieces. They were just dealing with themselves and they sinned and they walked away from God. We have, we have in John chapter 10, Jesus is, is talking to his disciples and he says this, he says, Verily, verily, I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who have come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep have not listened to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters through me will be saved. They will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to kill, steal, and destroy. I have come that they may have life and have it more abundantly. I believe one of the greatest pieces that we deal with is Satan wanting to kill us, to steal, and destroy. Satan tries to destroy us and tear us down. Satan tries to fill us with fear and harm us. He tries to affect our minds. He tries to affect our realities. He tries to affect everything around us. And we need Jesus Christ more than anything, and we're going to be dealing with these strongholds. Now, we could write a whole lot more on there. I'm just giving you a list of some of these. And in your own minds, if there's other pieces when the service is over, if you want to come up and add them to our list, write them down here. The reality is we deal with strongholds and barriers in our own lives. And whatever your stronghold is, whatever your barrier is, I know it's very real to you. And I know that God has a plan. As, as Satan tells us, as Jesus tells us in John 10, Jesus came that we may have life to the full. Or in the King James Version it says that we may have life and have it more abundantly. We have to deal with the strongholds. But here's the deal. As I talked about several weeks ago, dealing with strongholds, the hard part is letting go. Letting go can be very painful. Letting go can be very painful because we get so used to who we are. We get so used to what we've been living with and we get so used to where we've been at. And so even though it's, it's, it's something that's not what God wants, the thought of starting with something new, the familiar always seems to supersede and it, it pulls us in and it draws us in. And so we struggle with that. I, you know, I, I told you all that, that the doctor told me a while back I need to lose a bag of feet. Man, is that hard work. You know, I know I need to eat a little healthier. I know I need to exercise. And, and I wake up in the morning and I'm laying there in my bed and it's, it's dark outside. I'm thinking, I'll just sleep extra this morning. I just won't eat as much food. It doesn't work that way. I, I know that I've got to get up and I've got to exercise. And it's hard. It's, it's painful to let go of old habits and start new habits. And in my relationship with God, it's easy for me to get in the rut and doing the wrong things. And then when I'm there, it's hard to move away and let go. And God says, we have to do that. We have to let go. We have to move beyond ourselves. In Luke chapter 9, verse 23, Jesus goes along and he's talking, inviting his disciples to do what he wants them to do. And he says this, he says, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny himself and take up his cross daily and come and follow me. Why couldn't he just said, you take up your cross once a month, it would be so much easier. Or even one day a week, like if I took up my cross for Jesus on Sunday, I could do whatever I wanted Monday through Saturday. Man, it'd be so great. And in Luke's gospel, he says, we must take up our cross, his cross, daily and come and follow him. He said that because he understands that, that it's the letting go of ourselves and taking up his cross. It means that I'm willing to surrender myself fully to him. I'm willing to give all these things to him, and it has to happen daily. It's a challenge. It's tough. But he wants us to do that. He wants us to let go of our own desires, let go of who we are, what we are, and deny ourselves. And denying ourselves is a challenge. 
And he says we have to do that daily. You see, I, I really believe that what he's telling us is that when we surrender our will, to, to surrender our will, to surrender our wants, to surrender our ways to him is really tough. And, and we need to ask the Spirit to guide us. We need the Spirit to, to fill us and lead us and direct us so that we can get there. Because we can't get there on our own. We need him to do it. We, we ask God to guide us, lead us, and, and, and then we follow that path and it changes things. When we do it on our own, we end up like Adam and Eve. We, we do really good for a while and then we grab a hold of that tree and we say... That's one of the best looking apples I've ever seen in my life or whatever it was. I'm sure it was something nice and luscious and good. And so we reach up and grab it. I, my, my dogs, I turn them out to play in the backyard. And, and, and one of my dogs always goes to the apple tree and just keeps jumping up and trying to grab the apples because she loves the apples. And she'll, she'll just jump up and jump up and just relentlessly over and over jump and try and get these out. And I'm thinking... Molly, leave my apples alone. I want to eat them. And, and Rodney's like, you know, Dad, if you pick the apples, she won't keep doing that. And I'm thinking, I want them to be fully tree ripe. Well, letting go is painful, and we need to do what God wants. For the Israelites, in the passage I read from Numbers chapter 32, the letting go part was a challenge because they were committing themselves to saying, okay, we will cross the Jordan River with the rest of our family. We're going to build some strongholds to take care of our flocks and our families, but we'll cross the river and our families will be back here with our flocks and our herds and they're going to be following after Kate, taking care of this stuff while we're gone. That's painful stuff. It's painful to be away from that. And letting go has to happen. And, and if you're dealing with these things in your life, and you can fill in the blanks. Notice we left lots of blanks so you can fill them in. When we do these things and when we're there, letting go is a challenge. And it means creating a new habit to replace the bad habit. Zig Ziglar says that we never start a new habit without dropping an old habit. And it takes 28 days to develop a new habit. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of time and effort. It means letting go and willing to move into new territory. It means that we surrender ourselves to God, and which is the third part. We need to be fully, fully surrendered to God. It's not coincidental that Jesus said, the greatest command is this, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. He starts off there because he understood that in order for us to have a life that's filled with victory, we have to be fully surrendered to Him. Our heart is our passion. What are you passionate about? You, you spend a, an hour with somebody, and most likely you will find out what they're most passionate about, right? What we're passionate about, we talk about, we, we think about, we work towards. I, I remember back when I was dating. I, my, Viola worked at the, at the lunch counter in the restaurant at the sale barn in Kelowna, Iowa. And... And my dad was a foreman there, so I would spend a lot of time in the back working and chasing animals and doing all kinds of stuff with the animals. And, and I discovered really quickly that if I would, there, there was phones all over the sale barn, and you could take one of the phones from, the, from one of these places, and you could call up to the lunch counter at the sale barn, and you could ask whoever answered the phone to bring you, like, a sandwich or... A, a pop, a soda, you know, Pepsi, a Mountain Dew. And, and I discovered real quickly, if I would call up there, you know, if I did this timing just right, Viola would answer the phone. I'd say, hey, can you bring me a Mountain Dew? Because I didn't have time to go up there. I was busy working. And so she would take a Mountain Dew and she would pray to, back there to where I was at. And it's like, uh, there was days I drank like eight or nine sodas, you know. Because <laughs> I wanted to see her. And when she would come back, she was like, here's your, your pop, you know, and she just had the sweetest voice and the most loving and caring eyes. And she was just, I, it was just great to be in her presence, you know. Passion is who we are. And as a people, we all have a passion. What's yours? Jesus says our passion is to be Jesus Christ. The second thing he says is our soul, the core of our being, the very core of who we are is to be fully surrendered to him. Let your soul be sold out to him. Are we there? He doesn't just stop there. He says, let your mind, how we think, all the things around us, what are we thinking about? What, do we, what does your thoughts go to? When you, when you wake up in the morning, what do you wake up thinking about? Work? Family? Things that you're struggling with? One of these walls, we, 
Our mind needs to be surrendered to him. And it means that we have to be consciously aware of what we're doing. Then the last thing he says is we are supposed to also not just have our mind there, but our strength, our abilities, how we're able to function. Have we surrendered that to him as well? And in all these pieces, when we surrender it to him, what a challenge. You see, it's easy for me to get my head there. Man, I know the, exactly the right things I'm supposed to do. So I, I'm supposed to, I need to read my Bible on a daily basis. I need to have some quality time in prayer with him. I need to reach out and love my neighbor and take care of that. My doctor says I need to eat a healthy diet. I should have a portion of meat no larger than the size of my hand. If it's, if it's faceless and tasteless, I can eat it. If it doesn't look very good, I can probably have it. But if it looks good, if it smells good, if it tastes good, I shouldn't have it. I had German sausages last night in Columbus. It was awesome. And I gained three pounds. You know, it's like... But, but the reality is, is we, we can know what the right things are, but if we're not doing it, we haven't fully surrendered to Him. Paul says it this way in Romans chapter 7, and, and Paul says it so well. He says, it's really easy to know, but the doing and the knowing sometimes really struggle. So he says this way, it's almost like a tongue twister, so listen really closely as I read these words from, from Paul in Romans chapter 7. We know that the law is spiritual, but I'm unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate to do, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is the sin living in me. For I know that the good itself does not dwell in me, that is, in my sinful nature. For I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do, this I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is a sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work. Although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being I delight in God's law, but I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin that is at work within me. What a wretched man I am. Who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? And then here's Paul's summary. He says, Thanks be to God, who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. So here's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, I know what I'm supposed to do. My head has it here, but I struggle because there's this inside of me that's a sinful self that keeps reaching out to do the wrong things. And I got to get my head there, and I need to get my heart there, and I can't get there by myself. I need the Spirit of God in me to make it happen. That's surrendering myself. That's why the psalmist says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thought. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. The psalmist recognizes we're filled with ourselves. And we need to surrender that to God and say, I need more of you, God. I don't know about you, but I know that's a prayer of mine on a daily basis. And I, I find myself the same as Paul. It's like, I know the good that I'm supposed to do and I don't always do it. Why? And God says, you need me, Glenn, to get there. But there's a second part of God's peace. So in Mark chapter 12, verse 29, he says, the greatest command is to love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, mind, strength, and body. That's part one. I can only get there with God's help, right? So let's just look at this a little bit. We walk this journey with God's help, and so it means I spend time in God's word, reading. Get my mind filled with who he is. Get my mind prepared. I spend time in prayer lining myself up with God so that I can be where God wants me to be. I spend time in worship of God, recognizing the greatness of who He is. I spend time getting my body lined up. But He says, that's not enough. The second piece is to love my neighbor as myself. In other words, what He's telling us is that God calls us to walk this journey together with our brothers and sisters. We cannot do it on our own. Paul is saying we have to let go of ourself. We let go of ourself and we let God have his way in us. We can't do it on our own. It's in God and as God works his way in us and as God moves in us and as God changes us and as God directs our paths, it is then that we become who he wants us to be. So in 
in, in the Word of God, He's telling us that we have to be walking this journey together with our brothers and our sisters. We can't be there on our own. So for the Israelites, they were willing to live on the east side of the Jordan, but He says, we're going to cross the Jordan River with you. We're going to go before you, and we're going to make sure that you have taken care of the giants, the strongholds, the walls that are out there, so that you can live and dwell in the land that God has called. And today, I want to show us just a little illustration of what it means for us to overcome a wall. So I've asked a couple of guys to be volunteers. If you guys had come at this time. I, I chose these guys. They, they were, happened to be close by when I was picking them. And, and, and I picked some guys because I think they represent what really this is all about. So these are guys that are physically fit. They're, they're active. They're involved. They're living life. They, they work out sometimes. Uh, Greg, Greg and Neil, they do, a, they do a, a sit up a day, half in the morning, <laughs> the other half at night. No, I, but I picked some guys because I believe that, that really this represents who we are as a people. We have whatever it is that we have. we have. We have a little bit of muscle. We have a little bit of strength. That's getting into the Word of God, right? We read it. We study it. It gives us the ability to know and understand. But more than that, he tells us in Scripture, it is working together. And as we work together, we can scale this wall. These three guys, none of them can cross this wall by themselves. It's 10 feet, 2 inches tall. But together, the three of them can cross the wall. There's a, there's a little bit of a ledge on the back side that they can stand. Um, Ecclesiastes 4 says, Though one may be overpowered, two can defend themselves. A cord of three strands is not quickly broken. Jesus sent his disciples out in groups of two in Mark chapter 6 and in Luke chapter 9. When he sent out the 72, he sent them out two by two. He didn't want them to go by themselves. And he tells us the second greatest command is like the first to love your neighbors yourself. I'm asking you, who's walking with you in your life? Because you can't do it by yourself. We can try, and we can try, and even with help, sometimes we mess up and we slip, and we got to back up and start again. But as we work together, we can make a difference. And as a people, when we try and do it by ourselves, it doesn't work. We can't succumb this wall. If you think you can crawl this wall by yourself without using any of these brace on the side, more power to you. Uh, make sure you got a good insurance because you're going to maybe fall and break a bone. And I'll pray for you, but uh, it's going to hurt. And you see, in life, it's that way. It hurts when we try and do it by ourselves. The last point is this. We need to stay connected to God. And that happens in prayer and in Bible study and in worship. So I ask you today, what's in your hand? What's in my hand is who I am. There's not a whole lot there. It's just me. But when I surrender the complete self of who I am to God, and I walk this journey with my brothers and sisters, it changes everything. And so I spend time in the Word of God. I, I, I spend time in God's Word, not because there's a sermon coming, but because I need it on a daily basis. I am, as Isaiah says, a sinful man, and I live among a sinful people. I need God in my life. I spend time in His Word. I spend time worshiping and praising Him, and 
Um, I've been reminded again this week of some of the challenges of life and the, the letting goes and the challenges with that, but I realize that God has a plan. So I spend time in worship with Him, and, and that worship is just praising Him for who He is. Sometimes it's singing, sometimes it's, it's reading Scripture, sometimes it's interacting with my brothers and sisters. It's just living life, and all of life is to be worshipped. It, sometimes it's, it's my prayer time and lining myself up with him and making sure that I'm fully surrendered to him. In 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, Paul says it this way. He says, All scripture is God-breathed. It is youthful for correcting, for teaching, for rebuking, for training in righteousness so the servant or the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. In, Roman, in Revelations chapter 5, the angels and, the, and those that are saw in the seventh heaven, they're, they're just worshiping God. They're, they're praising God and they're saying, worthy, worthy is the lamb who was slain. And, and it describes this great aspect of worship. Why? Because he's worthy. He's worthy of all of our worship. So I ask you today, what's in your hand and how are you using it? First and foremost, surrender this, who you are to God. And secondly, realize that God says we walk together as a people. I invite you to stand, if you will. As our worship team comes and, and leads us in this song, Have It All, I, I'm going to ask you to do a little something else for me today, kind of symbolic. And if you, if you can't do this, I, I, that's okay. We'll work at it. But I'd like to invite you to just grab hands of those around you, symbolic of the fact that God never, ever has said in Scripture that we are to do this by ourselves. But he says we do this together. And so today, as we just join hands and hold with those around us, it's symbolic of saying, God, I want you to not only have it all, but it means we're all in this together. I'm going to love you with my whole being, and I'm going to love my neighbors myself. I know we struggle with who's my neighbor, and my neighbor is whomever it is that I meet and interact with. Let's pray. Truly amazing. As we come to the end of this series, God, just help us to remind that we want you to have it all. Not just who I am right here, this core of my being, but those I interact with and those I walk this journey with. God, I pray that we might be a people that recognize that our hand is really empty, but it's when we hold each other and when we hold on to you that it makes a difference. You have a plan for our life. God, we will face strongholds. We will face walls that need to be surmounted. And it happens as we fill ourselves with your word and with who you are and we walk this journey together with each other. God, we surrender ourselves to you. We commit ourselves to each other. May your kingdom come. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. 